Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to this evening's seminar as part of the Shaping Space um, exhibition program. Um, I'm Simona Valeriani. I'm one of the curators of the exhibition. And um, in a minute, also my colleague, uh, Vanessa Norwood, will be uh, talking and with us. It's also Harriet Jennings, the third curator of the exhibition. Um, and we, um, it is my pleasure to just introduce a little bit the context in which the exhibition developed. Uh, and then um, Vanessa will take you through the program for this evening's seminar. Um, the exhibition is actually the result of a long-term research project that has been kindly funded by the Arts and Humanities Research Council. The whole program started um, roughly four years ago when um, myself and my colleague at the uh, Victoria and Albert Museum, Olivia Horst Valterna, started an international research uh, project um, and network um, that brought together uh, all interested in the history and current practice, as well as the future of architectural model making, um, with the idea of sharing knowledge and take stock of the current state of the field, uh, and also um, identify possible areas for um, pushing the practice further and um, conducting some more um, some more research. Um, and part of this were the Swan Museum, the RIBA, uh, the Sorbonne, and um, as well as um, the Architectural Museum in Munich um, and the MAP Laboratory in Marseille. Uh, and as a result of this, um, the idea came to share uh, some of the insights that we gained through the project uh, through an exhibition. In the meantime, um, uh, Vanessa, who was part of the project as a member of the AEA, uh, had moved here to the building center. And so we started this adventure together, putting together an exhibition on um, models in practice, both historically and today. Uh, and we would welcome you to come and see the exhibition. It's still on until the 5th of March. Um, come and see it. Um, it was great fun uh, to put it together and we hope that we will you will enjoy uh, seeing it. Anyway, there are more interesting speakers um, lined up than me, so I'll uh, cut it short. Um, welcome again from me, from the VNA, from the Billing Center, and uh, I'll leave uh, the word to Gordia. Sorry, um, I'm Vanessa Norwood at the Building Center. Uh, tonight we are going to be asking that very pertinent question to build or not to build. And that is the question. We're going to be looking at making models or not to make models, exploring why practices make models, considering how model making forms an integral part of the working process, weighing up the cost and time implications, and thinking about how model making benefits practices of all sizes. We're really thrilled this evening to be joined by experts in the field of model making. Uh, first off, I'm going to introduce Edmund Fowles, Director of Field and Fowles. And Edmund's delivered a range of award winning projects from Field and Fowles' own studio in Waterloo. He's currently leading on a number of prestigious education project, projects, including the new dining hall for Homerton College, University of Cambridge, and new graduate, graduate accommodation and student facilities for Green Templeton College, the University of Oxford. Is also leading Field and Fowl's proposals for the Urban Nature Project, transforming the five acre gardens surrounding the Natural History Museum. Edmund's an external examiner at the Architectural Association, as somebody said, one of the founding members of the Architectural Models Network, and has taught and lectured widely, including at Reba, University of Cambridge, and London Metropolitan University, where he taught a design studio for several years with Ingrid Pettit, exploring new forms of education design. Rawdon Pettit, no relation to Ingrid, uh, is director of Stanton Williams and joined the practice in 2003. And Rawdon's currently overseeing the Museum of London's relocation to West, Smith, West Smithfield, as well as a prominent residential building as part of the redevelopment of the iconic Shell Centre site on London's South Bank. Recently completed projects include the redevelopment of the Royal Opera House in Covent Garden, which includes new foyer spaces and a 400 seat auditorium. And a fellow of the Royal Society of Arts, Royden, Rawdon has been a visiting critic at the architecture schools of Greenwich and the Bartlett, as well as Camberwell College of Art and Central St. Martins. 
We're joined by Stephen Setford, who designed, sorry, who, Stephen has studied painting at Wimbledon College of Art and has worked as a designer, furniture and model maker for over 30 years. And Stephen joined Stanton Williams in 2015. And 20 years. <laughs> sorry? 20 years. 20 years, that's a very important correction. Joined Stanton William in 2015, where you're responsible, Stephen, I'm sure you know, for overseeing model making and prototyping in the studio, where Stephen manages the in-house workshop and you were made associate in 2021. So Stephen's focus is the use of model making within the design process. And he utilizes his knowledge and skills in art design and making, working with the project teams to produce sometimes highly complex architectural models and prototypes. And we've had the pleasure of visiting the studio and seeing all the incredible models that you make there. But first, this evening, I will hand over to Edmund Fowles, who's gonna be talking about model making in Field and Fowles. So over to you. Thanks all for joining us this evening. We're, we're really excited to see how the evening unfolds. Thank you so much um, for the introduction. That's um, that's wonderful. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. Hopefully I'm sharing it now. Um, brilliant. Can everyone see, see that now? Um, I'll take that as a yes. <laughs> brilliant. So thank you for inviting me um, here this evening um, to contribute to this, this evening's seminar. Um, uh, the introduction was brilliant. It will, it will save me some time actually in giving an introduction to our practice. But um, I wanted to today really focus on the culture of model making and um, and what it means to us as a practice. And I'm going to talk specifically about our project at Homerton College in a bit more detail. Uh, so this is our team. We're a relatively small team of about 20 architects based down in Waterloo and working across a range of um, cultural, education uh, and heritage projects. Um, and model making for us has been really within our DNA since studying as students. And um, I just wanted to share a slide of our first studio some 10 years ago uh, when we, we set up. Um, it was a really important uh, factor for us to have space within our studio to make models. Um, and I'm gonna try and show you some of the less glamorous side of model making uh, rather than all the polished images that um, people tend to see on, on websites and things. Uh, so lots of the content today will be is straight off the iPhone uh, from the, from in and around the studio stuff that's sort of uh, in progress and a bit kind of hairy and rough. Um, and uh, I suppose this sort of cultural model making extends as well to our teaching as a practice. Um, and as mentioned in the introduction, we taught at the London Met, um, and we're particularly interested in large scale models and having um, the the fortunate ability to have outdoor space at our studio has enabled us to to spread out into the yard, into the farm, to make larger scale mo models on various pro projects and mock-ups as well. Um, and I think the most important thing for us with model making is that it becomes a really communal part of the activity of designing a building um, in this day and age of digital technology where people are more and more sucked into the computer, having a model out on a table in the meeting room, in the model shop, um, just becomes this really wonderful focus point for discussion. So I'm going to try and take you through five years of a single project and um, show the kind of the rough and ready process of, of making that we've we've gone through on that project. So this is the new dining hall, hall for Hamilton College, which we won at competition stage um, just over five years ago. And um, it's now almost completed on site. Um, and uh, the building is sited right next to this very handsome arts and crafts building, the Everson building. Um, so there was always a very um, intrinsic part of this project, which was about craft and about making. Um, so the, the use of model making to convey and to develop our designs was, was really kind of crucial through the process. Um, you can see here the sort of siting of the new dining hall. I'm not gonna go into too much detail about the design process itself, but more the interaction between the making and the way that that iteratively developed the design. Um, and there was a lot of kind of analysis early on about the kind of tradition of Cambridge dining halls as we went through the process of designing them, of, of designing this building from the very traditional um, collegiate dining hall to, to more contemporary examples. Um, and broadly speaking, the building comprises um, of a kitchen space to the north, a hardworking aspect, and then the, the dining hall, which we pushed to, pushed to the south, taking advantage of the, um, the green open space. 
and then lots of in-between spaces for gathering um, around those core principal uh, brief spaces, um, really kind of trying to enhance this sort of uh, uh, element of kind of bump in spaces. Um, and there was a lot of conversation about the formal and informal throughout the project. Um, so going back to the arts and crafts, um, this is the Iberson building, which was so important to um, our reading of the site and our kind of a real in inspiration to kind of design a building that was an arts and crafts building for the 21st century, benefiting from quite contemporary methods of, um, of dig digital modeling as well, but also making. Um, and as with, um, as, as with all projects, it, it starts on the drawing board in sketch form. Um, and the early models were kind of quite crude and rough and ready working between sketch and model um, to develop the first um, of six models I'll show you this evening, um, which um, began with um, a one to 200 model, which was used for the competition submission. So this was it uh, late at night in progress. And um, at this scale, um, and generally through the project, we, we work from the, the kind of larger scale or the smaller scale down to kind of uh, much larger scale models, one to 20, one to five, and even one to ones on this project. Um, but at this scale, we're, we're very interested in model making um, in both its ability to, to help architects understand the constructional approach um, of the buildings, the constructional approach to detailing. Um, so even at this quite, quite small scale, we were looking at the kind of the framing of, of these masses, the articulation of these two principal masses, which um, were both the kind of cafe and the, the main primary hall space. Um, and this was, uh, yeah, the model delivered for the competition and some of the more glossy images taken of that. Um, and it's amazing that once you um, uh, get photographs into Photoshop, even, even the models, you can begin to get a real spatial sense, even from a, a model of this scale, one to 200. Um, and then the second model that was made was actually still at competition stage at the kind of latter stage of the competition and it was a one to 50 um, and it was made to uh, convey um, in a bit more detail the kind of richness of materiality in the hall and whilst it was quite a crude model on the outside the internal linings were such that we were able to take really convincing photographs from the inside um, this was a photo of uh, the meeting we had with the college still during the kind of uh, selection process with the model to the right there, uh, but partnered with images that we'd taken of the model. Uh, and this was one of the photographs we'd managed to, to get from that, um, from that model. Um, so we were fortunate to win the competition and the, the designs uh, developed um, in plan, in section, um, and the siting of the building settled down we moved on to a slightly larger scale model, which began to get even more spatial internally. Um, and this was a one to 100 model um, used very much for kind of client sign off purposes. Um, this was really kind of around the stage three, stage two, stage three um, on the job. This is Jeff, the principal of the college, uh, taking a picture of the model. Uh, but as you can see, the, the level of detail, the level of kind of uh, structural awareness of the building begins to kind of grow in scale. Um, and also the thinking uh, around kind of relief on the elevation was beginning to develop here. Um, but it's actually, as we get into these sort of one to fifties, one to 20 models where it gets really exciting and it's the kind of the part of the scale of model making that we really enjoy in the office, working between really crude sketches into the models. Um, so here we actually extended that one to 50 uh, on the right, uh, on the left here, you can see the um, cafe and buttery space, which uh, was modeled as an addition to that. Uh, and then we began to get some really, um, really useful kind of interior um, views. Um, some pictures really crudely just taken with an iPhone, just stuck into the model and iteratively um, developed. So testing out different scalloping to the soffits, testing out different stair locations and even having uh, little fragment models along the way, which tested um, elements such as a threshold uh, and the, the meeting point between different construction systems. Um, and quite often these crude uh, models would come together, be sort of forged together and moved around on a table during design reviews, um, as you can see here in the studio. And this is always going on in tandem with one-to-one um, -one kind of material experiments. So in this case, we were, 
um, seeking to use a uh, kind of pigmented uh, concrete for the plinth to the building and carried out a series of tests in house um, because otherwise it's really hard to specify products like that. So working between the scale of the one to 50s and one to 20 models, we're also making, um, doing our own kind of pigment tests in house. And this was um, a stage in the job when we were actually modeling uh, the columns, which we wanted to be very uh, sculpted um, in this very deep facade, which is almost sort of Gothic-esque. Um, so we began to kind of test out different column forms and cast them using these, uh, this plaster with the sort of pigment tests, which then grew into this one to 20. Um, so as you can see, this process is very kind of rough and ready. We're not very precious about our models. Um, we, we enjoy involving lots of people in the model making process. So we don't have a kind of defined um, model maker in the office. It's, it's generally led by um, architects, part twos, part ones who are working on the projects. Um, and they become these assemblages, which look quite weird and wonderful, but um, eventually grow into things which can be really, really purposeful. And uh, we still kind of present to the clients. Uh, so as you can see here, some crude kind of iPhone pictures as, as this one to 20 model uh, emerges. And then inviting um, Jeff, the principal, and Deborah, the bursar for the project um, into the studio to, to have a look, uh, to comment on particular kind of internal linings in this case. And eventually the, the model was photographed and with a bit of, um, bit of correction in Photoshop, um, the, uh, these images were produced, which were really kind of helpful in kind of bringing along the, the client um, on that journey. Um, and I'll briefly rattle through the facade tests as well which um, again, working between kind of 2D uh, sort of drawings and tests um, and also kind of found materials. Uh, there was a, a, a material called faience that we were very interested in using a ceramic that could be cast uh, and create this really deep relief that we we're interested in. Um, and so we began making models using the material itself, using clay. So on the left um, is an extract from the digital model and on the right, a handmade clay relief of that same um, uh, model to, to test that kind of form in clay. Um, and then it gets translated again back into, into drawing form. Um, so there's this complete cycle of testing materials at one to one, feeding that into models at one to 20 or one to 50, and then um, feeding that into the drawn information. Um, and then that followed through into further development of the interior and really kind of referencing the richness of um, arts and crafts elements from the existing buildings on the left, the Ibison building, uh, on the right, the kind of the Great Hall, uh, the Victorian Great Hall, where you have this linen fold uh, lining. Um, so there was a kind of uh, an adaptation of that principle of a kind of linen fold lining, which was tested in this one to 20 model um, but we were always, also always working between the, the digital model to inform kind of the, the process of making the physical models. And uh, eventually photographs were taken of this model, which um, led us to sign off um, and kind of get the client on board with um, the vision for the interior. Um, and this shows the, the use of those images, testing, for example, here, different floor finishes in context. And later um, that being balanced with one-to-one -one kind of material sampling and then bringing that into the, the model photographs. And um, the scale then increased once more to testing actual carpentry joints as well, because the timber frame of the building, we wanted to have um, carpentry joints and try and reduce the amount of steel connections uh, within the building. This was actually a model made by um, the, the structural engineers. This is a one to two model of the, um, the, the connection detail of the timber at the, at the center of the hall. Um, and there was a very particular order with which that had to lock together, which um, was really helpful to, to model um, and, and get a sense of that uh, at scale. So if I got time, I'm gonna just whiz through some, some site photos just to show everyone kind of how that process of testing and model making um, has fed into the building itself. And that process continues when you get to site, of course. Um, those pigment tests we did early on were, were helpful, but then it had to be translated to the ReadyMix company that was gonna be forming the concrete. Um, 
there were various sort of agglomerations of samples that were, were brought to site to kind of test the final appearance. And probably our largest mock-up, um, which was uh, mocking up a single kind of curved column on site uh, to test the board-marked concrete, the pigmentation, the form, uh, treatments, and so on. Um, so in, in the last two or three minutes, I'm going to try and whiz through a, a quick summary of, of site, site progress over the last year and a half. Uh, so the concrete frame going up. Um, and it was brilliant having that opportunity to make lots of these elements albeit at a smaller scale in the studio, it allowed us to have much more um, informed conversations with the craftspeople who are making the building. Um, so here we see the frame being fabricated um, and doing some tests of the joints, um, bringing together that joint at one-to-one -one, and then it arriving on site and being uh, installed on site uh, and the sort of pin connections coming together and then at Darwin Terracotta, the, the fabricators for the faience as they make the plaster casts for the molds for the, the faience uh, and apply the, the faience um, model and then it arriving on site and being installed. And these are some photos from very recently on site just showing, um, I suppose a likeness to many of those earlier models, um, those kind of qualities of space um, was in, in large part given by the sort of tonality of the building and that pigmentation, the expressed timber roof um, and those lovely generous deep um, concrete columns at the, at the plinth and the faience elevation taking shape uh, on site a couple of months ago. And interestingly, we've paired um, recently a few photographs uh, of the initial model with um, the interior spaces and um, it was quite reassuring to see on the left here, this is a project uh, as built on site and to the right, the, the physical model at one to 20. So it's, it's really kind of powerful what you can convey through a physical model and with very little additional kind of overlaying of uh, Photoshop and so on. Um, I think it's, it's a really kind of vital part of our working process uh, as a practice. And I think it's a real education for all of our team within the office to be building models um, and learning through the building of models in practice to inform the way that we design and make buildings. Um, and that's my final slide. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ed. That was so interesting and brilliant to see how hands-on you all are. It looked I'm great. Sorry, it was quite rushed. It looked great fun. <laughs> It was, <laughs> no, it was that, was a, that was a great presentation. Yeah, yeah I'm interesting forward to, to see how... any questions later. Yeah. Yes, thank you. I'm now going to hand over to Rawdon and Stephen, who will be talking about Stanton Williams and the process of, of model making. So over to you. Okay, thank you uh, very much, Vanessa. I'm just going to, um, uh, I'm assuming that's okay, and someone will tell me if it's not. But uh, uh, again, Thank you uh, uh, for inviting us this evening and allowing us to give you a little uh, window into our work and the, the role the models have in the studio and, and to a, a great presentation there from Ed as well. And there'll be a lot of sort of overlap in terms of, um, in terms of ideas and kind of processes. But what I thought we would do is perhaps just give you a bit of a, a rapid fire journey um, as to kind of uh, why we make the sort of the different types of models um, uh, within our studio. And then I'll hand over to our kind of head, sort of head of our, um, our, our model making workshop, Stephen, um, who'll talk more about, uh, I guess, his role in, in, and what does that mean in terms of managing, managing a space and a team um, within an architecture studio, as opposed to um, a more sort of traditional model making company. Um, and he'll also sort of go into um, giving you a little bit more insight um, uh, into how we make models within the context of a, of, of a single project. Not as not as detailed as as Ed's then, but looking at our, our UCL East um, project on the on the Olympic Park. But I guess fundamentally for us, it's you know, the, the question is, is, you know, why do, why do we work with models? And, 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 and for us, it's about, I, I guess the value comes from how we and others can sort of emotionally react to, to a physical object. I mean, you just, 
you just need you just need to look at this or indeed any of any of the Ed's previous sort of images and you can't tell me you're not already sort of just transfixed your you know admiration either for the for the way it was sort of put together or your your mind whirring with with all sorts of questions that may even be sort of sub subconscious and that's just by looking at an image on a screen so kind of imagine how much more intense that is if you're actually there around a, a, a physical model able to sort of walk around it but more importantly able to touch it and smell it and and you know look at it with different sort of light in kind of re real time and i think as architects we're we're concerned about how people experience sort of space and and objects we we you know when, when we look we're engaging all of our senses um to kind of properly see and to sort of build up a uh, i guess a picture of understanding and and, and really register an experience and so for us by by working with physical models primarily it gives us it enables a richer um, engagement with, uh, with 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 an idea but what's also important to us as well is to kind of recognize i guess the benefits of model making as a craft in it in itself um, I, I use the word craft more than just the making of an object uh, by hand to serve a serve a purpose this is about celebrating the, the the potential that comes from that unison of, of kind of hand and mind the process of making becomes then a, a significant sort of factor in the identity of the object um, so we see our models it can either therefore be you know idea communicators but they're also about idea generators you know the act of the act of making these also also represents kind of the essence of, of, of design um, much in the way Ed was talking about how they how they sort of develop their kind of schemes. So by promoting everyone in our studio to uh, to make models, we are we are we are lucky enough that we've been able to develop a, a space and and a team to help assist that. Really, what we're doing is is we're just trying to improve um, our design process by by being more effective, but also more enjoyable. I mean, really, we're just in making where we're harnessing that that primordial urge as as humans to to make things um and you know perhaps now in, in in the in the modern day like many activities it's kind of moved from a necessity now to this provider of happiness and i think we're all striving to to provide a bit more happiness and well-being into our into our daily lives so i think i think for us um as a studio it's it's not a case of to build or not to build it's it's more of what to build and when um you know when we start a project our first act is 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 really to physically represent the site and the context uh, and and it's and it's brief because that is the most efficient way to collectively understand the spatial implications of all the issues at hand it starts to make it real right right at the right at the start for us what we then tend to do is that leads on to more intensive collaborative work we sort of gather our loose bits of material and sketching together and debating and exploring and, and experimenting all around the kind of a table it's not exactly kind of the um you know the the, the craft room in the corner of the kindergarten but it is that idea of, of of being able to just express ourselves folding paper tearing card kind of pinning foam call and ripping it all apart and really important for us this process sort of encourages that kind of magic of accidents what i mean sort of by accidents is, is that you can discover and assess immediately the experiential implications of of any change you make whether intentional or not or whether you're the instigator or actually it's a spectator noticing something that others others hadn't sort of seen and I think building in those those kind the ability to have those accidental discoveries in the design process is something that's really important for us and kind of enriching. And so we work with our models, especially in the early stages, to enable that to kind of happen. And and again, that is why in the early stages it's important not to be sort of too precious. We understand, you know, when with certain models, it's about the role of as a design tool not not an end product it it might be used for sort of generating further development and can we use a lot of 
photography that we might sort of apply kind of at this stage. But most of our projects sort of start by fixing material with just easily removable pins, as opposed to sort of hard and fast gluing. We, we kind of want to reinforce that, that, that sort of fact that this is just sort of a moment in time and is, is an exploration. And, you know, although the aesthetics of the model are not the issue here, it, it is often surprising how, how, how again, how often you can come with something sort of quite beautiful out, out of this sort of process. But at that sort of point in time, when our ideas are sort of formulated, I, I guess we, we also, we take a bit of time out as a studio to try and capture the essence of those thoughts and, and try and develop more refined and, and communicating sort of uh, models that are orientated towards capturing concepts. Um, I, you know, these, these are important for us because what that allows uh, us to do is, is a really engage the skills of uh, of Stephen and, and and his colleague Maz to sort of come into their own, by them helping working with the architectural sort of teams to sort of craft objects that translate these conceptual thoughts. And these are great for clients and stakeholders, especially sort of at competitions. But they're also there they're there to remind us of the essential qualities of the of, of, of the scheme. And, and those responses sometimes might be abstract or quite specific, but what they're also doing is, is they're reflecting an importance we give to, I guess, to the experience of craftsmanship in our own work, you know, that, that, will, that will come as a result of developing a, a scheme. Yep, they're, you know, they're, they're supposed to sort of, from, from audiences, generate understanding um, and, and support and trust and, and, and admiration uh, even. But they're also there to allow us to communicate our ethos. So, you know, it is about rigor of ideas, commitment to craft as an artistic expression or, or, the, or that quality of execution. It's, it's a really fun time um, uh, during, during the process of, of a project. And many clients obviously demand more specific, let's say, objects for their marketing purposes. Um, Stephen will talk a little bit more about this, but we don't usually include uh, this service in our fees, um, unless maybe we're allowed to dictate what the type of model is pr produced. Um, you know, we might we might outsource a uh, others to fabricate parts. You know, such as such as a site context that we can sort of insert to. But I think we prefer to sort of spend our our architects and our model makers sort of resource more on developing the objects that kind of serve a greater purpose than than just a just an exhibition. Um, this allows us to sort of get more quicker into sort of focusing on, on, on key areas and where we get to use the models sort of both to develop the ideas as well as using them for presentation purposes to gain to gain sort of support and, and, and trust and here the the level of quality sort of evolves it becomes more refined as as the ideas sort of crystallize and again we'll use our we'll use our model makers to sort of really help assist us in either in either sort of carrying out some fabrication or more often than not just really by mentoring our, our, our staff in terms of sort of uh, techniques and, and and efficiencies but what what they also do which which is a really wonderful kind of you know moment is is, is they kind of help us to start to develop identities for these these miniature environments that are kind of beyond the scheme itself you know, the models then become recognizable as, as, as I guess, um, products of aesthetic endeavor and, and also signatures of our, of, of our practice. They're, they're translatable across a range of projects and neither reflected in maybe there's a, a theme in the way we might start to represent material or su supporting objects such as people or vegetation. But, but really, it just brings a, a bit of additional joy to, to, to the experience. Um, but I think we work most closely with our modeling team during the detailed development of ideas. You know, we, we have a, a, a lot of projects on. And so using their skill to sort of investigate and communicate ideas to convince ourselves and, and others ends up sort of resulting in quite a lot of one-to-one -one kind of model details. And this might be about practical purposes for testing, you know, technical kind of arrangements and working with clients. Um, or indeed, just sort of looking at the experiential aspects of use, or um, uh, especially when we're when we're sort of proposing things that that, that aren't sort of standard. Um, it also allows us to sort of work at at certain scales of of, of working models that 
that have enough resolution to allow us to kind of engage with the, with the quality of spaces and, and, and those materials to really start to investigate the way how light or, or furniture might affect, affect its experience. And always striking that fine balance between refinement of the model and the ability to continually amend it as, as, as a part of the, the design process. And we may often, you know, look to sort of develop even more finalized models to reflect specific sort of important details, looking at construction techniques and, and in particular those sort of associated with more human interaction. And sometimes we use these elements even as a part of our, uh, of, of our tender um, uh, sort of uh, submissions for, for, for construction. But I guess to achieve all of this, you know, we've we've made sure we've endeavoured to try and have spaces in the studio um, and that, you know, that, that that allow the support and encouragement of, of kind of all of our staff to sort of make things. And this this workshop's really kind of special. It's, it, it's an attractor. It hosts teams and design crits and clients. It, it's an inspirational space for all, you know, surrounded by activity that but I think hopefully, hopefully installs that kind of same wonder that I talked about at the start when looking at, at, a, at, a, at a model in itself. And I, and I think it's that, it's, it's that inspiration that we're trying to keep generating and permeating kind of through, through our studio. I think with, with this image, it's probably a good time to maybe hand over to sort of Stephen to maybe talk more from his perspective as a, a, as a model maker. Um, what, is, what does this entail and, and his, his role? His role. Thanks, Rodin. Um, yeah, so th this is our this is our main model making space, which is um, is sort of centered around these big work tables. These these work tables are on wheels, so they can we can move them around. Sometimes we make very big models, so we have to we they have to sort of span across them, or so depending on what we do. Um, the space is. Um, it occupies one end of the studio with a with a, a partition for, for acoustic reasons. Um, but even though there's this physical separation, it, it feels very integrated to the to the studio. And you know, some people find it a refuge to work work in the model shop, and and we get a lot of visits from people uh, in the practice who you know they want to get away from their screens for for five minutes and see what we're up to and, you know, to try and get a bit of inspiration. Next, please. So we also have a, a, a dedicated soundproof workshop with a, with a range of uh, machines, like a table saw, a band saw, some disc sanders and, and, and a drill. We also have a, a spray room. And I, I guess having having these machines to supplement the, the, the main model making space, it, it really sort of opens up all the, you know, a lot of making possibilities and you know, it allows us to work in timber and, and you know, like solid acrylic and stuff. So but it's, only, it's only the model makers that are al allowed in this space um, for health and safety reasons. So Currently, they're, they're, there's two full-time model makers at, at Stanton Williams. There's me and my colleague, Maz. Um, Maz ha has a degree in model making. And since graduating, she's, sort of, she's worked in museums and she's, she's sort of done pop making, as well as working in other architecture studios. Um, and I, I come from uh, a fine art background. And I studied painting, um, and I guess when I, I was studying, I, my my work was sort of, even though it was a painting course, I sort of started to make more installations and and architectural interventions, and and, and I got interested in sort of um, architecture theory and things like that. So I thought I thought when I when I left college, I thought. I'd, It'd be quite interesting to get into model making as 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 a, as a way of, of I guess I was I was interested in learning about architecture and design more than learning about model making and model making techniques and things. So so 
So I guess that drew me more to working, you know, it, it made more sense to work alongside architects rather than in a model making workshop. Um, it was it was also important for me to to work in a place where I could, you know, be a bit more aligned aesthetically and ideologically, um, which I think I'd find difficult if I worked in a model making uh, company, as as you know, the models made there will be like from a variety of different practices and different styles and purposes, and and I just wasn't really interested in, in that. Um, and I, I think also the big difference between working for a model making company and an architecture studio as a model maker is that the focus is more on the process of design, less about a finished product. And, and, and that's just what I, I, I prefer. Um, here we're, we're interested in different processes and it's, it's important for us to keep new ways of making on the radar, which, which helps us push the work we do. We tend to be led by what the project demands, as opposed to trying to use a new technology for the sake of it. And there's, a, there's a lot of research by the teams that goes into the cultural and physical context of the project. And we'll sort of look for a making process that will help give us shape and form in response to this. Um, and, and in this way, we're open to all kinds of making techniques from traditional craft to current fabricating. It's, it's whatever it takes really to develop and explore our ideas. Um, but, you know, in choosing the, the processes and materials we work in, we, we, we try and keep it quite democratic. So the model making processes uh, are, or the, or the model making materials, primary uh, things that you can cut by hand or, or cut on the laser cutter. Um, and if we do learn a new process, we try to share it with, with um, other people so other people can, can take part. Um, next, please. So I, th I thought we'd just do a quick run through of, of one project. Um, like a history of a project through models. Um, and this, in this instance, it's UCL East, which is a building at the Olympic Park, and it's currently on site. So when we started working on the competition, it was quite a small team. And um, the brief we were working to was quite prescribed in terms of massing. So the conversation developed quite quickly to this idea of solid and void. Um, so here's the selection of initial styrofoam models, exploring the, the carving out of this central space. It was made by uh, Jason, who is one of our architects here. Um, you know, we we talked through what they were trying to do, and, and we we showed Jason how to use the hot wire cutter so he could he could start making. Uh, these models. Um, and I guess what it started to show quite quickly was the potential complexity of an interest in the negative space that was formed. Um, so we encourage this uh, to be modeled like as a solid, uh, which showed the models in the black. And this helped form uh, the concept of our proposal. which we then took on uh, to celebrate in the, in the form of this uh, new compositional model that formed the basis of our submission uh, in explaining the scheme in its basic volumes, but also being able to sort of build the, the model in front of the jewelry, so it's strengthened the understanding of the, these sort of abstract ideas. Um, you know, we, we do this quite a lot, the, this sort of building in front of um, uh, our clients, because we find it sort of engages people really, really nicely. Um, so the, the, we, we cast the, the negative space in, in copper. Um, 
It, it was actually copper powder with resin. I think it's called cold casting. Um, but it, it, it has a lot of copper in it, so it behaves very similarly to, to copper. And, you know, it's very tactile, and the more you touched it, the, the more patinated it got. And, and we, we, we like this because one of the key ideas was that this, this space represented, um, or the, this negative, this solid, uh, sort of showed this negative space which was um, represented this social and collaborative spaces of, um, and it was where all the different departments kind of crossed over and I guess became contaminated with each other. And, and we thought, you know, this sort of um, touch and patination is a good way of sort of uh, expressing it. Um, so, so, you know, when we started looking at this building, it was, quite, it was quite difficult for people to understand how this vertical circulation worked, especially looking at, at plans and sections, because it's such a three-dimensional space. So when we made the model, you know, you just get it straight away. Um, and we, we use a lot of photography on models and we'll annotate them. And it, it sort of allows us to communicate even more understanding of the scheme. Once we were happy with the floor plates, we started to develop a working model that pulled all these elements of the building together. The design team worked with us on, on this. It was quite a complex model to make and it took some coordination. As we wanted to demonstrate not only the facade treatment, but also the interior spaces. So we made it in three separate pieces. Um, out of uh, quite lightweight materials, although the, the facade and some of the ground floor elements were machined. Um, and, and this allowed a degree of sophistication, but also gave us the ability to be able to continue to use this model as a working design tool. Um, um, I sort of noticed when the project teams have been working quite intensely on the project, mainly on the computer, um, and we build a big model like this. It's, it's, it's like they've seen, seeing the building for the first time at that point. Um, the, and the building process can be you know, very long and the design teams are working with a, a lot of different information and individuals are focused on different parts of the building. So we find models like this provide valuable moments in the process where you, so I see the accumulation of all this collective work kind of distilled uh, in a single object. And, uh, and, you know, this model had many lives, uh, you know, bits were taken off and reworked throughout various stages. Um, as Rhoda mentioned earlier, there's always a fine balance between, you know, um, how precious we are with the models. Um, and as a model, as a model maker, you um, when you're making a model, you know you've worked out, you know how you're going to make it, and there's a logic to that and an integrity to it as an object. And and then someone comes along and tells you that the design has changed, and, and you know some people can find this really difficult, and you know you can create an internal dialogue. Like, Am I going to resist this for the sake of making, you know, keeping the integrity of the model? Am I going to pull it apart or have to improvise and adapt it to, so it still physically holds together and visually holds together? And I guess you always have to go with the choice that serves the design process. And, and I actually really like it when you start to see a bit of history in the model. And, and you know, even beyond that, we, we um, we use the model in, in, in the RA summer exhibition. You know, it was, it, was, it was looking a bit tired and we did some minimal tidying up, but we, we thought it was a, a really good artifact of our working process. And, and it sort of brought a rich, richness and identity to, to the project. So we, we were asked to make a, a wider consultation uh, 
but we we sort of chose to primarily focus on developing the brief and and, and uh, bringing information together to outsource and, and oversee the fabrication of the model. And you know we don't we don't believe it's in our best interest to commit time and energy into making these sort of exhibition pieces. And um, we have a viewpoint that if we're gonna, not going to learn anything from design wise from making the model, then we don't really need to make it in-house. You know? and, and making a model like this could actually, you know, you know tie us up for weeks or months and pull us away from other projects. So as, as the scheme developed, the, the project internally sort of split into two teams, one dealing with the exterior and one dealing with the, with the interior. And you know, we from here we we identified several key areas that we wanted to explore through models. Um, we sort of helped the team sort of analyze to, to what extent each model uh, you know would be made, and and you know the materials and you know the construction, and um, and and also you know like a way of making something so you can continue manipulate them and, and you know, use them as design tools. Uh, and, and, you know, the, primarily the team undertook these, these kinds of models and we, we'd sort of dip in and out and support, um, support people when they needed a bit of support. And, and um, yeah, it, I guess these models were, were you know, intended to capture some of the qualities of the spaces, you know, in, in terms of materials and proportions and key details. So, you know, and that may also sort of help inform some of the visualizations that were, were prepared. And, 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 and also we, we look a lot at the visualizations and the 3D models to, to kind of work out how we're going to make them. So it sort of goes back and forth like this with, with different, you know, mediums. And and I guess this sort of, you know, the making continues into one to one. Um, and I, it's it's quite strange when you sort of see see a space that you've made lots of models of. And you get this very strange, familiar. You know, it's so weirdly familiar, but it, it, all, it also, you know, you, you get a lot of surprises as well as in, in this translation of scales. So, um, I think I think I'd better stop there because um, I'm aware of time. Thanks, Thanks Rawdon. Thank, thank you all. That's so interesting. I mean, I guess we've answered our own question. It's definitely to build. We have very enthusiastic proponents of model making here. So it's always going to be yes, build models. Um, I'm going to ask a few questions that have come in through the Q&A. Um, hopping back to Ed, you, you don't have a Stephen in your office. It looks very hands on. Do, how does that process work? Is it trial and error? Is it really, are you all learning as you go along? And have you sort of become experts in model making through that kind of process of trial and error? That's a really good question. I was going to say, I wish we did have a Stephen in the house. Um, the models look absolutely wonderful. It was, I was really enjoyed your presentation. Um, yeah, I mean, actually, funny enough, when we first set up, we had a dedicated model maker, and, and that was great for a time. And we were, we were making a lot of mock-ups and, uh, and models at that time. Um, but actually, as things um, moved on, um, we, we found it worked really well for um, assistants, part ones, part twos, young architects to be really getting stuck in themselves. And um, I think um, Rawdon made this point that, you know, it's an opportunity to come away from your desk, to spend time um, it, delighting in something that's good for your well-being. You know, everyone enjoys making, everyone enjoys a, a change of scene. So actually it, it was um, quite a conscious decision to, to move away from having a dedicated model maker and we kind of benefit I suppose from the fact that we're quite small um you know in a much bigger practice and I've worked in bigger practices there's a lot 
more need to uh, for, for kind of dedicated model makers, I think. Um, whereas we're at the scale where um, we, we take a similar kind of approach, I think, to um, to Stephen and Rawdon in that if there's a big bit of context that needs making, we won't do it in house, we'll just outsource it. And there are some brilliant companies that, that can uh, rustle up a site context model very quickly. Um, but it's really the, the models, the sort of the larger scale, the one to 50, one to 20s, where the architects and assistants who are working on them are, you know, making leaps and bounds into the development of the design by getting their hands dirty. Um, and skills wise, I think, you know, people are so well equipped coming from university, uh, you know, studying that they're, they're all making an awful lot of models at school generally. So um, often we'll, we'll get kind of the youngest people in the team saying, oh, have you tried doing this? I did some casting when I was at, at uni. And actually, I wrote down that, that point about the, uh, the copper powder cast. That sounded amazing. That was a really beautiful model. <laughs> um, so we're, we're always kind of looking to other practices, looking to our young, enthusiastic team members who've got all these ideas from their time in school. And it brings a real richness, I think. Yes. And it, it, it's funny, we're, from us as a studio, it wasn't really a conscious decision to set up a formal model making team and get a model maker in it. Um, again, like Ed said, we sort of started where somebody somebody just said, look, I, I wouldn't mind just hanging out here for a bit longer and, and doing some other models. And, and we started to see a real benefit with that. And then and then by chance in sort of, as that person moved on, we, we you know, I think it was a backpacker who sort of came in and and we'd never even worked with a, a trained model maker sort of before and it blew our mind. Um, and, and so what we ended up doing was, was almost then evolving that to create a role that just empowered someone to really just curate. This is your space, you tell us what you want. We'll tell you how we would like to work and what we would like to do. You tell us how to sort of do it. And, and that's what we've that's what we've done with, with Stephen and sort of Maz. Let let them sort of you know. That, that's what seems really interesting. And Stephen sounds like a real facilitator. And probably um, mm. there's there's more volume of models being made by other people than there are by your two model makers because they're the catalysts. They're the the experience. They're maybe working the, the more complex tools and things. But it's a really good model. Um, but I, I like the point about there being people in the office who kind of move things forward or perhaps have that real burning sort of sensation to make and um, there's been one or two people over the, the history of our practice who've really moved on our making as a, as a practice they've kitted out the workshop um, they they've made certain models which have inspired others in the practice so it's interesting it kind of comes down comes down to individuals and they're kind of um, then pushing it I mean, you all spoke as well about the sort of the digital versus, versus physical. And I, I was wondering, well, actually, someone asked how lockdown has affected the process. Did Were you all at home making? Stephen, how did you cope? Well, um, <laughs> I guess right at the beginning of lockdown, um, I, I, I was working with um, Zoe at the time. She, she, she was working with me in the model shop and... We both kind of set up in our in our you know flats, um, which was you know it kind of worked for a little bit, but you know you quite quickly get so snowed under with like the offcuts and stuff, and and particularly Zoe was living in a you know like a house share, so she was making models on the on the kind of living room floor, and um, so we we sort of quickly we we realised that no one was in the office, so we sort of started coming back into the office and, um, and and I guess photography became, you know, like a really big thing with, with models. Um, we, we invested in a, in a, you know, like uh, a nice camera, and a nice light. And because I, I was like, um, yeah, Ed, Ed, you were saying with, with the, the photographs of the models, I think these, you know, they still, you know, you, you still get a feeling of the, the, the modelness of them and and this sort of jump in scale. Um, so so I sort of still feel felt they were really effective, even um, you know, seeing them as photographs. But but then people, uh, teams would come in to, to look at models as we, as we were still making. Yeah. But it was it was quite. 
sorry, it was quite funny because it was a, <laughs> a lot of felt as though we were slightly in the Flintstones because we were sort of on a Zoom call to Stephen going, now turn the model that way. Turn the, <laughs> where we knew full well there were other companies just with 3D models just whizzing through and doing all that. And we were just kind of doing our own cardboard bo box version of, of that, you know, change the light and get in here and do that. But it, it was it was difficult, and it's it's one of the it's one of the main reasons we've been encouraging people to return to the studio. Um, well, actually, yes, you you almost answered the question that I was about to ask on behalf of Dan, who used the Q and A to ask about the benefits of models, and one of the he talked about natural light coming in. I mean, I guess that is that sort of having the physical model there and seeing how light reacts to it is a really important part of the design process. I mean, are there other benefits of model making that you can, apart from that sort of edge, the collaborative nature of your model mm. making looks so compelling in your photos. Well, if you had to sum up all three of you, the benefits of model making, almost impossible, but have a go. Yeah, well, I think it, the top three would probably be, yeah, firstly, that that ability of the model as a kind of artifact, as, a, as an object. And um, I enjoyed Rawdon's introduction, actually, talking about this sort of compelling nature of a model to draw people. They're kind of magnetic, um, you know, very different to, you can occasionally look over someone's shoulder at what they're doing on screen, but it's, it's not the same as, as engaging with the model and having conversations. And um, that's not just with the people who are helping to make the model, but more widely, the whole office has an ability to, to comment it's not always a good thing, but um, <laughs> to kind of engage with the model. So I think that's the sort of the social and the cultural side of it, I think is, is really valuable. Um, but also the, um, the ability to learn from the actual physical act of making the model, really learn about how a certain junction comes together, how two interfaces come together. Um, and then I think thirdly is the kind of the quality of the images that come from a model is, is really, for us, we, we love that style of image making where you take a photograph of a model and you might do a few tweaks, but there's nothing that can quite emulate the quality of light. Um, renders are getting better and better, but they're just not quite the same, uh, the way that light falls on certain materials. And I, and I think, yeah, I, I don't really want to add on, on, on too much on, on top of that. Mm. What, what we, what we're, We've, we've got a, a, a big background in designing exhibitions and what you learn when designing exhibitions is actually the space between the space between the object and the viewer is just as important. And so with models, there's this whole context sort of around it. And that might be, again, the messages a model gives you when it's sort of plonked at low level on a, on a, on a worktop with crap all around it versus versus then you take a bin and you stick it on the table and you put the model on top of the bin and now the model raises it sort of self up suddenly you're reading a lot of different things you put it into a, a case and you put it into an exhibition with fancy lighting on it you read sort of something else as well so i i think it's just it's just the flexibility that a model gives you you know with one object to just sort of identify and get the mind thinking about so many different things or you and, and, and your colleague might be looking at exactly the same direction, but you're both seeing something, something just a little bit, a little bit different. And I, I think for me, it, it is, I, I, you know, maybe I use it glibly, but it's just the happiness. It's, there, there is just something ab about looking or making it that calms us all, calms us all down, reminds us what it is that we really enjoy doing and, and, and we're privileged to sort of, to sort of do. Um, That's a yeah, the, yes, the only yes. thing I'd, I'd, I'd add was um, like going back to lockdown as well. Um, like when, when you know, design sessions were going on on, on Zoom, um, it was really difficult to because we're, we're, we're sort of used to, you know, being able to use and work the model and affect the, the kind of thoughts and ideas like very directly and you can't really do that very easily with like using you know Revit or, or, or whatever um, and, and you know quite often um, you sort of end up with like lots and lots of different options of a single point of view to try and work out what's what's best so you kind of lose yeah, that sort of directness I guess. 
So physical model wins. We are slightly over time. So I'm going to, to end us there and say a massive thank you to Rawdon, to Stephen and to Ed for joining us. Big thanks to my fellow curators, Simona Valeriani here in the room, Harriet Jennings as always controlling us from the other side of the room. Come and see the Shaping Space show. It's open till the 5th of March. Yeah, big, big thank you to the three of our speakers this evening. Um, a very enthusiastic set of reasons why to make models and happiness maybe is the one that we will end on. So yeah, thank you everybody and, and good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.